Number four, these truths make me alert to man-centered substitutes that pose as good news. There's something about believing the doctrines of grace, which is another name for these five points, the doctrines of grace that alerts you to be able to detect ideas posed as good news which aren't good news. In my book, The Pleasures of God, I try to show that in the 18th century in New England, the slide from the sovereignty of God led to Arminianism, then to Universalism, and then to Unitarianism. And the same thing happened in England in the 19th century after Spurgeon. Ian Murray's biography of Edwards documents the same thing. Quote, Calvinistic convictions waned in North America. They've never returned as the central, the central force they had in the First Great Awakening. God may be doing something like that now. I don't know. I'm encouraged on, all, on a lot of hands of what I see in the renewal of these things. Calvinistic convictions waned in North America in the progress of the decline which Edwards had rightly anticipated. Those congregational churches of New England which had embraced Arminianism after the Great Awakening gradually moved into Unitarianism and Universalism led by Charles Chauncey. You can read the same thing in J.I. Packer's Quest for Godliness, page 160, how Richard Baxter forsook these teachings and how the following generations reaped a grim harvest in the Baxter Church in Kidm Kidminster. These doctrines are a bulwark against man-centered teachings in many forms that gradually corrupt the church and make her weak from the inside all the while looking strong and popular. The church is the of the living God is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. Were that she were, would that she were that. So the point there is beyond what you are able presently to articulate, believing these central glorious things provides you with a kind of ballast in your boat so that as the winds come against your, your sailboat, they'll, they can tip you, but they won't tip you over because there's just something about these doctrines that hold you from making many mistakes. So, you, you know, when, when, when people ask, you know, what, what do you do at Bethlehem to pr protect people from all the false teachings that come at them over the years? And my answer isn't, well, we have classes on every one of them, you know. Every single false teaching, and everybody has to go to those classes, and everybody has to become aware of what's coming down the pike. Now, I, there's no, that's hopeless. Rather, we stay close to the center and just keep hammering away at the magnificence of God because there's just something about a church in which you feel the weight of the majesty of the glory of God that is a safe place, doctrinally. They're not getting blown around. They're going nowhere. They're not trendy people. Number, number five. These truths make me groan over the indescribable disease of our secular God-belittling culture. I can hardly read the newspaper or look at a TV ad or billboard without feeling... I do watch TV ads at, you know, Pizza Hut and on vacation or billboard without feeling the burden that God is missing. When God's the main reality in the universe and is treated as a non-reality, I tremble at the wrath that is being stored up. I'm able to be shocked. So here's the point. Most Christians aren't shocked when they read the paper that there's no section on God. But a big one on sport and a big one on business, and a big one on entertainment, and God, gone. Totally. That doesn't shock anybody. He's just gone. Watch TV, 24 hours in a row, God, maybe a swear word, 
maybe mocked in some stupid priestly caricature, but gone. Nobody's shocked. But if you believe these things, you'll feel shock. It enables you to keep feeling shock that God created a universe in which people are ignoring Him. Shock. Because if you don't feel some shock, you won't be able to articulate the dangers of hell with any credibility. I pray for awakening, revival. I try to preach to create a people that are so God-saturated that they will show and tell God everywhere and all the time. <clears throat> we exist to reassert the reality of God and the supremacy of God in all of life. Number six. These truths make me confident that the work which God planned and began, He will finish, both globally and personally. The whole doctrine of perseverance was intended to make that plain, but just know how emotionally precious that is to me. God's got a lot of work to do on me yet. I don't know whether I'll live a year or 10 or 20 or die today. But it is massively encouraging to me that God is sovereignly committed to work on me and never let me go. And that he will do that globally. He's going to finish the Great Commission. He's sovereign. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. God intends that there be a completion of the Great Commission, and He is God. Did He not say, as His last word, all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to me. Go make disciples of all the nations. I'll be with you to the end. Oh, how that should resonate in our minds because of His sovereignty that these doctrines preserve. Number seven. These truths make me see everything in the light of God's sovereign purposes. That from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever and ever. All of life relates to God. There's no compartment where He's not all important. The one who gives meaning to everything. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. All of it, eating, drinking, seeing God's sovereign purpose worked out in Scripture and hearing Paul say that he accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will makes me see the world in this way. So you're listening to NPR and every single interview has to do with God. They don't know that. He never gets the proper credit. I got so furious at an interview I was listening to yesterday. I, just wanted to, I did. I turned it off. I said, I'm sick of this. But I listened for a while. I want to learn. I want to, I want to know my culture. I want to know what I'm dealing with. But I'm hearing everything through this grid. Ev the annual games in northern Canada right now have to do with God. A gay doctor writing poetry and extolling how poetry helps him be a better doctor has to do with God. That's the one I got so upset about. I listened to probably 15 minutes of it, and I'm hearing the whole thing through how does poetry relate to God, how does doctrine relate to God. And then this whole gay thing came out, and there was no sense of moral concern but only celebration and I couldn't take it anymore because God says that doctor is going to go to hell if he doesn't repent but that wasn't coming out just like the rest of us will go to hell if we don't repent